Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ron Ackerman. I'm the director of the Institute for Public Health and Medicine, and welcome to our IFAM webinar series today. We're fully virtual. Uh, so as people are entering the Zoom room uh, for the presentation today, I want to just remind people that, uh, uh, as always, during the time of our presentation, if you have questions or that you'd like to ask of the presenter, please enter them using the Q&A function on the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, we don't monitor the chat for questions, so please don't put comments or questions there. Uh, use the Q&A function, and what we'll do is, uh, at the end of the presentation, time permitting, we'll go through the questions and uh, answer as many as we can. Um, it's my distinct pleasure today to introduce our presenter, Dr. Emily Silverman. Uh, Dr. Silverman is an internal medicine physician at the University of California, San Francisco, and is the creator and host of The Nocturnist, an independent medical storytelling organization that has uplifted the voices of 350 plus clinicians through sold out live performances and award winning podcasts. Her writing has been published in the New York Times, Virginia Quarterly Review, JAMA, Chest, and more. Dr. Silverman is currently advising a new doctor's organization known as Medicine Forward, which advocates for recentering the doctor patient relationship in American healthcare. She practices medicine at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, where she teaches students and residents about clinical medicine and the power of deep listening and connection at the bedside. Without further delay, is my Distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Emily Silverman. Hello, can you hear me? I see a thumbs up. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. My understanding is that there are a lot of different people in the audience. There's clinicians, there's researchers, there's public health folks. And before I begin, I just want to kind of pause and acknowledge the um, tremendous amount of work that you've all done in the last few years as we've been dealing with this pandemic. And, you know, our public health workers um, have been so, so crucial during this time. And uh, I know that there are a lot of challenges with public health and it's just so important. So I just wanted to, before I begin, say a word of appreciation and gratitude for all that you do to keep um, your communities safe uh, all the time, but especially during this pandemic. So I'm Emily, I'm a doctor in San Francisco, and I'll be speaking to you today about storytelling and also about some of the work that I've done related to storytelling. Whether you're a clinician or a researcher or a public health worker, storytelling is definitely a core skill that can be of use. And that's true professionally, but it's also true personally. And so what I'd like to do today is just start off by telling you the story of how I came to become interested in storytelling, introduce you to some of the projects that I've worked on. I do have a few audio clips to play, so I hope that you'll uh, enjoy those. And then at the end, um, I'll just talk a bit about storytelling and, and why it's important, and then we'll open it up for questions. So this image here was taken a few years ago. I think it was the first image ever captured of a black hole. <laughs> and the reason that I put it here is because sometimes I feel like the greatest bursts of creativity actually occur from a place of, um, you know, change, distress, destruction, you know, there's kind of the death and rebirth cycle that can uh, help new things come into being. And so for me, this journey in storytelling really started during residency. So I had always wanted to be a doctor from the time I was a little girl. Nobody in my family was a doctor. I just, for whatever reason, really wanted to take care of people, learn about their bodies, um, understand biology, this really deep and painful curiosity that uh, was pointing me toward medical school. And I loved medical school. I really thrived there. It kind of felt like a kid in a candy store, just loved everything that I learned. But then about halfway through residency, I really hit a wall. 
And I think there were a few reasons for that. One was I was noticing that medicine wasn't what I thought it would be. Um, I was spending much more time sitting at a computer than I was sitting with my patients and just felt really confused about why wasn't I enjoying this job as much as I thought I would when I was a little girl. And the other piece that I noticed is I had always been such a creative person, loved reading and writing and the arts. And in residency, I noticed that I was becoming increasingly estranged from those parts of myself, disconnected from my creativity, disconnected from my spontaneity, disconnected from this part of myself that I really treasured and that I considered to be a core aspect of what made me human. And so with these parallel questions, you know, why don't I like it in medicine as much as I thought? And also where did my creativity go? I set out to answer them through storytelling. And uh, initially I thought maybe I would write, but a friend of mine in San Francisco invited me to go with her to a live taping of The Moth. So for those of you who don't know The Moth, it's a live storytelling show and they also have a radio show on NPR and it's very bare bones. It's just a stage, people get up on stage, they tell a real true story and that's it. It's this very primal and ancient art form. So she took me to this show and I just remember walking out of that theater and thinking to myself that this is something that we need to be doing in medicine. I loved writing, but there was something about that live experience and that magical interface between an audience and a person on stage that was just really intoxicating to me and just felt so needed. So I went back to work and on my days off, I got in my car and started driving around the city and walking into little theaters, little local theaters, and asking what it would cost to rent the theater, which was actually very uncharacteristic of me. I had typically been not much of an entrepreneur, not much of a starter. I was more of a sheep. I was, you know, I got good grades and I kind of climbed the ladder from college to med school to residency and did what I was told. But this was really one of the first times in my life where I really felt like I was originating something. And I don't know where it came from exactly, but it came. And um, the very first Nocturna show is depicted here. This is January, 2016. And I was able to rent this beautiful Victorian living room in a shared house um, for about 90 bucks. And I got a bunch of my colleagues and co-residents and even some faculty to come and sit in the audience and then several of them to stand on stage and tell stories. And this was just the seed of, of what would become the Nocturnist. There was no story coaching. There was no preparation. It was just really casual and really raw. And at the end of the night, there were like tears. People came up to me and they said, when are you going to do the next one? You know, this is so nourishing. So I knew that I was onto something. I had really struck a nerve. And I, I think the nerve that I struck was that a lot of other people were having what I was having, which was this loss of sense of creativity and so on and so forth. So um, from that point on, I built a little team around me. We did some fundraising, we um, grew. And uh, this is a photo of um, a theater in the Mission District in San Francisco. It's called the Brava Theater. It holds about 350 people. And we started to fill up this theater on a regular basis with virtually no advertising. And again, I don't think this is anything special about me. I think it was just this hunger in the healthcare community to be engaging with their work through this more narrative and humanistic lens. And then this picture here is from the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco. Um, this room holds over 700 people and we filled it up uh, for our show on the theme of transitions. So at a certain point, we started to pick a theme for each live show. And so imagine walking into this large theater and you look around and there's doctors and nurses and med students, and there's people from Stanford and UCSF and Kaiser and private practice and Oakland and the Peninsula and Marin and just Bay Area healthcare all coming together uh, to sit in this room and to hear their colleagues stand up and talk about their 
personal experience. Um, so this was a wonderful way to build community and to kind of tap back into that creativity like I was talking about. Now this was from January, 2020. So nobody in this audience knew what was coming. Um, and of course, COVID-19 arrives and we are not able to do live shows anymore. By then we had already launched a podcast. So this is the logo um, called this The Nocturnus. And the podcast was pretty simple at that point. We would uh, audio record the stories from the stage, pull them onto the podcast, air them. And then after the story ended, I would sit down with the storyteller in a studio and we would have a little conversation and unpack the story further. And so we were doing this. And what was nice about that is you didn't have to be in the Bay Area to hear the stories. You could tune into the podcast and be a part of it. And so through this podcast, we were actually starting to build out this little nervous system of healthcare workers across the United States and even internationally, mostly the United States, of nocturnist listeners. So there were people on the West Coast, the East Coast, the Midwest, the South, doctors, nurses, med students who were tuning in and you know joining this community. And what that meant is that when the pandemic came, that nervous system already existed. And so our team looked at each other and we said, oh my God, we are you know, getting ready to absorb one of the biggest impacts in modern medical history, this pandemic. Our mission is to humanize healthcare, to support clinician well-being, to transform medical culture through storytelling, all of these things. So how do we serve our community in this moment? How do we support healthcare workers through this pandemic? So what we decided to do was put out a call for audio diaries. So this was different from telling a story on stage. So for that, we would pair people with a coach and they would craft, you know, like a perfect 12 minute story with a beginning, a middle and an end and an arc and conflict and stakes. And there was a lot of editing and preparation that went into it. But for this, it was just an audio diary. So it was coming home from work, you know, closing the door, sitting on the bed, turning on your phone and just talking into your phone and saying, you know, today is Tuesday. I'm a, you know, intensive care doctor in Milwaukee, and this is what I'm seeing today. And so we put out this call and because we already had this network, we just got all this audio flooding in um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of audio clips between the months of March and May of 2020. And so what our team ended up doing was taking all of that audio and creating an audio documentary series about the pandemic. And we did it in real time. So we we almost did it in the style of Saturday Night Live, where uh, we would release episodes on Tuesday and the episode would come out. And then we would turn and look back at all the audio that came in the previous week. And we would say, okay, what are we hearing? Um, how do we pull out clips that are especially compelling and that we think speak to what's happening in this moment? How do we put clips next to each other that are similar? How do we put clips next to each other, which contradict each other? Are there paradoxes here? You know, what, what is happening? And so um, we would pick the, the clips, we would air them kind of very simplistically back to back, put them out on a Tuesday, and then the clock would reset and we would do this again. And we did this every week for 10 weeks. And I still maintain that that project is what got me through the pandemic. It was, I had to do something and, um, and that's what we did. And this is the illustration that we commissioned for that series, which is called Stories from a Pandemic. Um, the artist is Lindsay Moan. She's amazing. And here's an audio clip. Today is April 26th. It's a Sunday, five o'clock. And yeah, I'm in the hospital, even though I'm supposed to be off, but I don't care today. Because I am, I am walking through the basement and I'm looking at a unit of convalescent plasma. Like I'm holding it in my hand and walking it to the ICU right this minute because my hospital is lucky enough to be one of the sites for research that we've got something in our arsenal that we think really works. And it's really cool. I've watched everybody perk up at each stage of this process of hey, we got registered as a site. Hey, we consented and enrolled our first candidate. 
but now that now that it's here, now that I'm looking at it, it feels going so much better. Um, when I go in to consent another person in another room while we're waiting on it to thaw, I feel hope. We feel energized. And so I think that's you. what we all need right now because the hope and the energy is is losing it. But you know, it's it's those little things. The the patient that we discharged from the rehab unit to go back to his family who was up and walking gonna be like his normal self that that was a win too that was a good one so yeah I'm really excited to walk through the ICU doors and go hand this off to the nurse who's gonna hang it for our really sick prone ventilated patient who is happens to be one of my primary care patients through sheer dumb luck today's a good day I don't mind being at the hospital today just left the hospital and the sun is out. It's gorgeous outside, but best thing, the very best thing is the refrigerated trucks are gone. None of us wanted to talk about why they were there in the first place. And we're still going to lose patience. There's no question there, but things are starting to feel more like we can we can handle the bad stuff and the, there's more good stuff. Thank you for listening to that. So um, in case you couldn't hear, this was a physician in the Midwest who was carrying a bag of convalescent plasma in her hands, um, you know, and thought maybe that this would help her patient and was expressing the excitement of that feeling after not really having any options for treatment leading up until that moment. And what I think that clip really reflects is um, the power of in the moment storytelling. Like you can hear the elevator saying going up, you can hear her heels clicking on the hospital floor. You can hear her plugging her car key into the ignition. And it's just so immediate, which I think is really unique. Often when there are historical events, people will be interviewed months or years or even decades later about their experience in retrospect. But I think what was nice about this is our organization was small enough that we could really be nimble and pivot and announce that call for audio diaries like immediately and start collecting them. And so we were able to really trap the first wave of the pandemic in Amber in a way and, and kind of get people's experiences in real time. So um, there are a lot more clips like that, but that just gives you a taste of the sort of material that we were receiving. And I just wanted to note that this body of work, the audio diaries was acquired by the United States Library of Congress as a historic record for preservation um, so that future generations, whether it's researchers or historians, um, can hear straight from the mouths of healthcare workers what was happening during those first few months of the pandemic. So we're really proud of that. And then here, I just included a quote from somebody who participated in the project. Um, I'll just note that some people chose to give their name when they participated, others opted to be anonymous. And we really felt strongly about giving people that option because especially in those early days of the pandemic, um, it was risky. A lot of healthcare workers were speaking out about not having enough PPE and speaking to the media about it and actually um, you know, fearing retribution from their institution. And so um, we did accept a number of anonymous contributions for that project. So here she says, uh, I was not prepared for how much this would mean to me. I've only recently re-listened to the podcast and was shaken by how raw our voices sound. I had put that time into a box and placed it on a shelf. I didn't realize how sad that made me. And now knowing that these raw moments will be preserved in time in a monumental way, in a monumental place brings me comfort. The fact that I was a part of something that will allow future generations to understand makes me proud. Thank you for the opportunity. And so again, I think just the meaning of kind of being able to preserve these voices and, and what that uh, what that means for the healthcare workers who, who contributed um, is really important. And I will say that 
during that time when the episodes were coming out, I would listen to them on the day they were published, but then I didn't listen to them again for about six or nine months. And um, it wasn't until later when I re-listened to those first few um, episodes where it really hit me like, oh, this happened. And so um, that was just kind of an interesting experience from the perspective of putting it together. I think being in a more creative and artistic role did allow me some distance initially, some protective distance. And then later it, it didn't really sink in um, exactly like what we had documented here. So um, this next image is from a similar project. So um, the first wave of the pandemic started to go down a bit around the summertime and rightly a lot of the national attention in that moment pivoted to um, to the event of the murder of George Floyd. And, you know, we had already kind of developed this well-oiled machine of how to put out a call and receive audio clips and uh, really felt called to kind of take all of that infrastructure and open it up to the black community in healthcare and, you know, just offer a platform, offer a voice. And so, um, you know, as that news was unfolding, I called up my friend, Ashley, I don't know if any of you know Dr. Ashley McMullen. She's an internist also in San Francisco at the VA. And um, she is a wonderful writer and storyteller. And I also called up my friend Kimberly Manning, who's a physician uh, down at Emory in Atlanta. They're both Black women in medicine who are really passionate about the humanities. And I said to them, you know, I'd love to do something. What do you think? And so we teamed up and decided to collaborate. And so uh, the summer series was called Black Voices in Healthcare. And Ashley hosted that series and Kimberly executive produced that series. And it was a similar format where each week we would toss out a prompt. Um, so maybe the prompt was becoming or birth or hair was, we had a whole episode all about hair. And, um, and then people would send in audio clips and we did another 10 episode series that summer very, very quickly. And um, that's also some work that I'm that I'm really proud of. Here you can see the illustration. The, the artist is Ashley Floreal. And to give you a flavor of the type of stories that we received for this series, um, I'll play another clip. So sit back and relax and enjoy this clip. I, I love this person's voice so much. I still remember the day I met her. On rounds, I'd taken over our service on the inpatient HIV service, and she had been in the hospital about 30 days. Young girl, advanced HIV AIDS, battling a couple of opportunistic infections. And she was starting to finally get better. She was being weaned off oxygen and was starting to regain her appetite. We had started her on antiretroviral medicines in the hospital. I remember meeting her and she's probably 24, 25, slightly older than my kids. And all I could remember was how little she looked and how much hair she had. Her hair was big, it was huge, but it was matted. And she'd been in the hospital, she'd been in the ICU. And through all of that, the transfers back and forth, no one looked at her hair. I've spent many years in the hospital. I'm used to bringing in little hair ties and getting out the little rubber bands on my wrist to give to a patient. Because I know Black women, our hair is important. Our hair is part of what defines us. And when people are in the hospital, a lot of times, that just falls by the wayside. The little bowls at the bedside with the one shaving stick and little tiny comb doesn't cut it. It never has, it never will. And there's nothing like having your hair done to make you feel like you're getting better. But this one girl, well, young lady, was just finally getting better. And I told myself I would braid her hair. I'd never done that for a patient, but there was something about her. She had this fight in her eyes and she was going to get better. And I know that just feeling better about how she looks would help. So I asked her how she liked her hair. And she said, oh, she always got her hair done, twists, braids, different things. 
So Saturday morning, we got done our rounds. It's pretty early. Didn't have a lot of admins. We were pre-call. And I just went into her room and I said, hey, do you want me to braid your hair? She was surprised. I said, doctor, you're going to? I said, sure. I said, I've been braiding my sister's hair for a long time. I have three younger sisters. I have two daughters. Both my daughters used to fall asleep with me braiding their hair. I like to tell myself that my hands are, are soft. I sat by the bedside and I braided her hair into eight cornrows to the back. She looked fabulous. Thanks for listening to that. Um, so in case you couldn't hear it, um, this is a story of a Black woman physician um, taking care of a young Black woman patient and braiding her hair into cornrows. And I think is such a beautiful illustration of why it's important to have our clinician population um, represent the population that we serve. This next image is from our most recent audio podcast documentary project. Um, so this project is called Shame in Medicine, The Lost Forest. So yes, this is about shame, the emotion of shame. And the way that this project started is at some point early in the pandemic, I got an email from a philosopher in the United Kingdom, and you'll hear that in the clip. And she said, I've been listening to your podcast for a while, and I noticed that so many of the stories are um, expressing shame, although they never use the word shame. So what do you think about doing a whole series just on shame in healthcare? And I was really fascinated by that concept. And so she and I teamed up with another physician down at Duke University. His name's Will Bynum. And we created a whole show, a whole podcast documentary about shame in medicine. And that was some of the work of my life. We, again, put out a call for shame stories, received a couple hundred stories from clinicians. And um, every week we would meet and kind of listen to clips and figure out like, okay, what themes are coming up? How do we want to cluster these stories? And um, what kind of narrative scaffolding do we want to do? And that series is 10 episodes. Um, and actually the series finale, episode 10, was just published uh, on Tuesday. So all 10 episodes are finally out and able to be listened to. And um, there's just so much there. I feel like I could probably do a whole talk on the topic of shame in medicine. But long story short, Luna, um, the philosopher in the United Kingdom, she got interested in shame more uh, in the doctor-patient relationship and really got into it through um, plastic surgery, actually. Uh, so it was examining this relationship between, you know, clinicians who would do plastic surgery and patients and how, you know, maybe the clinician might um, foment some insecurity in the patient so that they keep coming back to get plastic surgery. And, you know, she kind of was looking at it at gender and at the body and things like that. Um, but what ended up happening is she, she went to a conference in Ireland and met a physician, Barry Lyons and Barry and Luna were talking to each other. And Barry was saying, Luna, there's a lot of shame in the exam room, doctor patient going both ways, but, you know, largely in the patient. Um, but there's also just so much shame circulating in medical culture at large. So we shame ourselves, we shame each other, we shame our med students, you know, shame, you know, having to do with the way we teach, shame around litigation, shame around, you know, so many different things. And so um, the two of them actually teamed up to start a project called the Shame in Medicine Project. And then this podcast with us um, was kind of a project that's that came out of their project. So um, anyway... Long story short, this um, has been some really interesting work because it's helped uncover some of the clinician psyche. So, you know, what are our motivations? What are our flaws? What are our insecurities? What are our strengths? Um, examining the physician origin story, like when we show up to the gates of medical school, like what are our backgrounds and why are we there? And I have some great stories about those things too. So, Anyway, I have the trailer here and I'll just play that briefly um, so you can get a sense for what this series sounds like. One of those events that you live in fear of as a resident, as a physician, where you and everyone around you, and there were a lot of people in the room, 
know that something has just gone terribly wrong. And it's almost like time stopped. I feel incredibly uncomfortable and incredibly exposed. And what I see are the eyes of the people standing around me. And I feel the judgment. And the only thing I know to do in that moment, some sort of subconscious primitive impulse is to leave the room. A couple years ago, I got an email from a philosopher in the United Kingdom named Luna Dolezal. Luna had been listening to The Nocturnist for years, and she wanted to know if I'd ever noticed that the emotion of shame was coming up again and again in these stories. I had not noticed this, but I went back and listened to several of our old episodes, and I realized that she was right. I started to see shame everywhere in medicine. And what was stranger was that nobody was talking about it. And so Luna and I decided to team up with Dr. Will Bynum from Duke University to investigate this incredibly powerful emotion and how it manifests in medical culture. Your, your brain tells you the most unkind and outrageous things that are totally ridiculous. But the only way that you find out how ridiculous you are treating yourself is when you talk to your colleagues about their own experiences and you realize how universal some of these shame experiences are. He presented it in a way that said, you should have known this, you missed something big. And at that moment, I felt my stomach drop and felt like I wanted to sink into the floor. When I think about this, the words just sort of go away. Um, it's almost like there's a protective mechanism that's tripped off that says, hey, that's not something that you should be talking about. And why? Why did I beat myself up over it so much? For once, I went from complete suffocation to now I could actually take my first few breaths. Shame in Medicine, The Lost Forest, is a 10-episode audio documentary series that premieres next week. See you then. So I guess that gives you a flavor for that project and... Um, that voice you heard at the beginning, Will, he tells the story of a medical error that happened when he was a family medicine resident. And that shame experience for him was so powerful that it inspired him to dedicate a large portion of his research to studying uh, shame experiences in medical learners. So Will and Luna are just really, really wonderful resources to learn about this topic. And I think that really shines through in the series. We had never had a project before where, where we brought in expert voices like that. And so you can see here that um, the storytelling work is continuing to evolve in different ways. And um, another way that this project is different from Black Voices and Pandemic and the live shows is this is the first project where we've actually developed an impact campaign to, to launch alongside the art. So in addition to the 10 episodes, we have an engage tab on our website where you can find discussion guides, facilitator toolkits in case you wanna spark a conversation about shame in your own community. Um, we have questions about each episode. We have additional resources. We have a portal where people can submit their own reactions to the series. And so we're really trying to lean into this idea that the work we do is an act of co-creation, that you know, we we ask the community what's coming up for them and how are they feeling. And then we we use that to create the series. And then it is sort of a feedback loop um, so that our work can continue to be in dialogue with the healthcare community. So and this um beautiful collage uh is by an Italian collage artist. His name is Beppe Conti and um he's fantastic. So um, now that things are opening back up again, the Nocturnus is resuming its live show. So I will say, I don't have a picture here, but we did have our first live show since before the pandemic in June in San Francisco. And I know all of you are in Chicago. We actually have a show not too far from you all that is coming up in April. Um, it's on Saturday, April 22nd, which happens to be Earth Day. And the theme for that show is Rebirth. And it's taking place at the Parkway Theater in Minneapolis, which um, 
isn't too far from you. So we have an open call for stories for that show. Um, the deadline for submissions is April 20th. And um, there's a ton of stuff on our website about our process. Um, but just to summarize, it does not have to be a fully formed story. So we, we're really looking more for story ideas. And then once the idea is selected, we pair our storytellers with a coach who really helps them shape their story for the stage. And that's been a really transformative process too, is to be able to work with a healthcare worker on shaping their story because it's kind of half story development, but also half therapy. It's like really uncovering what is this story trying to say? Like, what was that moment really like for you? And so um, again, just uh, another example of the power of storytelling, which is actually a good segue. I know we only have a few minutes left before we open it up for questions, but um, I just wanted to, to speak a bit about the power of storytelling. So as I mentioned, it's a very ancient art. Um, People have been telling stories for a long, long time. If you think about old works of art, like the Odyssey and the Iliad, people used to memorize that stuff and recite it in front of, you know, a crowd. Um, and if you think of, you know, sitting around a dinner table and telling a story with friends or sitting around a campfire, there's just something, again, really connecting about that entire process. Um, and there's a theory that came out of Harvard um, from a guy called Marshall Gans. And this is pertinent to you all. So, so Marshall talks about the power of story for the story of self, the story of us, and the story of now. And so really looking at the power of storytelling at three levels. So first is the story of self. So like I said, in our story coaching process, by taking something that's happened to you, an event, and externalizing it, whether that means talking about it with someone, jotting down some notes about it, that can actually help you hold up a mirror to yourself and understand yourself better. And I'll give you an example. Um, I was just doing some free writing uh, a year or two ago, and I was writing about this video that I, that I found in my childhood home. Um, I'm an only child. And it was a video that my dad took of me when I must have been, I don't know, around six or seven years old. And I was standing in the backyard and I was holding this rubber ball and I was throwing it into the air and letting it fall and then picking it up, throwing it into the air and letting it fall. And um, there was a sweetness to the video, but there was also a sadness to the video, like something about being an only child and kind of wanting to play catch, but not having someone to play catch with. So I was writing about this and this sentence just stumbled out where it was like something about how it captured an essential loneliness or, you know, something like that. And I just remember that the sentence came out onto the page and I looked at it and I was like, whoa, um, because that was something about myself that I actually didn't really consciously know that, you know, being an only child, this feeling of essential loneliness, like that's not something that was really in my conscious mind, but um, the power of the art and of the story is that you can, you can surface some of these subconscious truths um, through story and, and really just start to understand yourself better. And, and so, um, you know, we all tell ourselves stories. We all have narratives of self that we show up with. Um, and I think it's really important to kind of look at those narratives and deconstruct them and, and play with them and use them to, to understand ourselves better. It can be hugely therapeutic and also a really great tool to, to move difficult experiences through, um, especially in medicine, when so much of our job is to interface with um, people who are going through difficult times. And we got to get a way to pass that through us and kind of stay um to have that spiritual hygiene of, you know, being able to metabolize that and kind of be healthy and move on. And some people like to go for a run and do exercise, other people process through writing and storytelling. And so it's a very powerful way to, to move those experiences through. So, so that's storytelling in the self. Next is storytelling um, and the us. So storytelling is a really important tool when you're coming into a dialogue with another person. So moving beyond the self and into the one-on-one -on -one, whether it's a personal relationship in your life or whether it's the patient in front of you at the bedside, um, story is a tool that we can use to connect. So, you know, maybe something as simple as just 
asking somebody to tell you about themselves and, you know, provide some context for who they are as a human being. And I think we've probably all done that at some point. And then in retrospect, realized how helpful it actually was to have that context um, within which to operate when we're figuring out how to best take care of that person. And then also thinking of our patients as having their own narratives of self and being able to use that as a tool um, as physicians as well. So there are many ways to heal. Some of it is through pills and potions and procedures and surgeries, but we can actually use the substance of story to help people as well. So kind of asking people like, how do you see yourself in this moment? What would you like the next chapter to look like? You know, um, how are you seeing this disease fitting into the arc of your life? And, you know, how, how is it fitting in? And if it's not feeling good, like how might you want it to fit in in a different way? And so we can use these things to help people cope and move through illness as well. And so um, that dialogue uh, and that storytelling and kind of bridge building across experiences can be really important and powerful. Um, in these last few minutes, I'll, I'll talk about storytelling and the now. And so this is probably most pertinent for you all since you're public health workers. Um, you may have had experiences where you're shown a data, a data, you're shown some data and you're shown a story and both are really powerful in different ways. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're really trying to move people to action, whether you have an ask, like wanting them to do something, sign a petition, pass a law, um, you know, change a policy at an institution or at the state level, um, you can show people data all day long, but when you couple that data to a story, that is what gets people motivated to actually make the change and to, and to make the move. And so, um, and there's actually science backing this, that, that the data is actually processed in one part of the brain, and then the story is processed in another part of the brain, and it's sort of a deeper part of the brain. And so um, story is really a shortcut to... Um, getting people on the same page as you and helping them to align with you in whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. So um, having narrative competence um, as an advocacy social justice person is a huge asset and can really help you um, advance your agenda and, you know, get healthcare to populations and, you know, do all of the good things that we know that you all here do. So we're at uh, 44 minutes. Maybe I'll stop here. I've been going for um, a while now. Um, I mentioned the Minneapolis show, so I just wanted to make sure you're aware of that. But um, yeah, I'm happy to open the floor for questions. And thank you so much for listening to me speak and for hearing the audio clips. And uh, it's been great. That was outstanding, Emily. This is Ron. I'm. Um... Seeing in the Q&A, we do have some questions. Um, I, can, I can read them uh, if that's helpful. The first is, um, have you ever done a show on medical humor? Hi, Richard. Um, we haven't done an entire show on medical humor, but we did have a medical student tell a story about medical humor or gallows humor, as she put it. And in that story, she was really grappling with this question of, is it okay to laugh at work? Especially when, you know, your job is to be around people who are suffering. Like, is it okay to bring humor and levity into that situation? And so her whole story is an exploration of that. And she has moments where humor emerged at work and it felt really good and healthy and moments where humor emerged and it actually felt kind of not good and disrespectful. Um, and she talks again about gallows humor. And one thing I've heard about gallows humor is one way to know whether it's appropriate or not is to figure out which of these two categories it falls into. Are you walking through a graveyard and whistling? Or are you walking through a graveyard and kicking over the headstones? And so really feeling into like, is there more of a light um, attitude to the humor or, you know, at what point does the humor feel like it's disrespectful? And so that I thought was an interesting metaphor for how to think about medical humor. Um, 
but uh, a lot of stories that come through the nocturnist, they tend to be really heavy. So I think humor is so, so important. And if you have a humorous story that you would like to share, I encourage you to reach out. We'd love to hear it. Um, the next question also from Richard is, uh, you brought up Homer, the original bard. Do you ever use poetry or song in your stories? Song, definitely. So um, both in the live performances and on the podcast, we have used music. In the live performances, usually the music is interstitial. So we'll use the music as a palate cleanser between stories. But at our most recent June show, we actually had an amazing concert pianist on stage with a Steinway piano and she was an improviser. And so somebody would come up and tell their story for 12 minutes and then they would walk away and then she would play music for like maybe four minutes and it was completely improvised. And so whatever it was that she played was inspired by what she was feeling after hearing the story. So it was all in the moment. And I'll never forget, there was one story that was especially heavy and she actually got up and kind of climbed into the piano and was playing the strings in this really atonal dissonant way from inside the piano. And it just blew my mind. So yes, love, love, love weaving music into this work and would love to continue to do so. On the podcast, we actually had a lot of music in the stories from a pandemic series. People were cooped up at home. They had nothing to do. We had a medical student in New York City who sat on her stoop and played um, the Bjork song, Virus, on her guitar as you're hearing sirens nonstop in the background. And that was like a really eerie and also like artistically interesting moment. We also had a couple doctors in San Francisco uh, sneak into a room with a piano and they played um, Lean On Me on the piano with a guitar. And this was actually right around the time that Bill Withers, who performs that song, um, died of COVID. And so they, they played the song to honor him, um, but they also dedicated it to their East Coast colleagues who were dealing with that initial surge of the pandemic that we at the West Coast hadn't really seen yet. So. Um, that was really powerful. I think that song is at the end of episode four of the pandemic series and just ending these episodes with sound design and music really adds. And so um, song, yes, poetry, not as much, but I love poetry. I'd, I'd love to think about ways to start to incorporate that in more. Uh, Tina Laurie Harris asks uh, or says, I, I am a, I'm starting a storytelling program in combination with yoga and meditation to heal trauma for BIPOC communities. Do you have any suggestions on how to start? That sounds like a great program. Um, suggestions for how to start. I think being trauma informed around storytelling is really important. Um, so maybe the first thing to do would be to kind of sit around with some people who you know and trust and talk about how do we develop and design and implement a storytelling program that um, doesn't like re-traumatize people, but that actually facilitates healing. And there's a lot of literature on there out there about how to think about that. Um, you know, certainly that's something we had to think about a lot as a team um, around pandemic, Black voices and shame, actually all three of them, there were some stories that came up that were pretty intense. And so thinking about how do we take care of our community and the storytellers and, um, you know, I could go on a bit more about how to think about that and you can email me and we can talk offline. But um, the thing is, if it's done in a way that is trauma informed, it has tremendous, tremendous power to heal. Um, so I think that's a fantastic idea and to pair it with movement um, yoga, for example, like then you've got the movement, the, the physical movement, and then you have sort of like the narrative movement and that can take you in some really exciting directions. Uh, Salva Bobley uh, asks, um, if you are a PhD researcher uh, who work in healthcare, but don't directly care for patients, uh, are you eligible to submit a story idea? Yes, yes, you are. We are actively um, trying to di diversify our storytelling community. So because I'm a physician, 
a lot of our storytellers have been physicians just because it's been kind of like my networks, but actively looking for other types of healthcare workers, whether that's, um, you know, nursing, physical therapy, speech language pathology, um, also researchers, um, people who are, you know, taking care of patients in a different way, whether it's the bench or data or whatever it is that you do. Um, yes, would love to, to get your story idea and bring you in. Have you considered a program on medicine and war, for instance, in Ukraine uh, or in the Middle East? Great question. So we do have some um, great relationships with people at uh, MSF, uh, Medicine Sans Frontier, which I can't pronounce in French, um, also known as Doctors Without Borders. So they send doctors and nurses into you know, high conflict situations, whether it's natural disasters or wars and things like that. Um, we did a virtual event with them uh, about the pandemic a while back that was really interesting. And I actually just earlier this week was emailing with them and kind of batting around some ideas on how to collaborate in the future. So yeah, I think um, really thinking globally about what it means to be a healthcare worker and not not narrowly, because um, a lot of times we focus on what is it like to be a healthcare worker in the dysfunctional American system? <laughs> and there's a lot that could be said about that, but but certainly zooming out and thinking about you know, the global experience of what it's like to be a healthcare worker in different settings is, is certainly something that we'd love to explore. Emily, you talked about how um, the telling of, of stories became really therapeutic for you as a, as a physician. And I, I wonder how that's uh, evolved over time um, to just uh, your heightened sensitivity to looking for stories and, and maybe um, being more aware of a physician of like um, how you're feeling when somebody's communicating with you or you're having an interaction with a patient. Why am I feeling this way? What, 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 what am I experiencing? And almost uh, you're, you're looking to elicit stories implicitly in everything you do, but in, in, like in, in some ways, just the process of telling your story makes you I, perhaps more aware. And I, I'm thinking about it as like, uh, as, a, as a protection against burnout as a physician and, and being aware of one's emotions and the effect of those interactions on internally. Is that true? Yeah, so I will say back when I was in residency, which was this black hole burnout period, I was very out of my body at that time, not to get you know to California woo-woo on you all, but um, you know, in medicine, you're very disembodied. Um, people tell you to ignore your desire to sleep. People tell you to ignore your desire to eat. Um, standing in the OR for 12 hours and you're ignoring your bladder telling you to go to the bathroom. And so there's so many ways in our medical training where kind of paradoxically the body is our object of intense study and scrutiny. And yet we're so disconnected from our own bodies. Um, it's, it's this strange paradox that I'm still wrapping my mind around. And so part of my journey with all of the storytelling work is like coming back into my body. And then that there's a lot about that. That's awesome and wonderful and healthy. I think ultimately is incredibly healthy and important. Um, but it does come with an increased sensitivity, which, um, sometimes can, make you more prone to being overwhelmed and, you know, understanding like at what point do you have the capacity to engage at what point do you have to step back and really learning how to, how to set boundaries. And so I think that's um, something that's an ongoing struggle for our profession because there is just so much sensory input, whether it's visual or, you know, smells or um, just other people's stories, other people's trauma, like how do you move that through? And I think, you know, really thinking of yourself as a vessel and kind of trying to purify and keep that as clean as possible um, is important so that you don't get overwhelmed. And I'll just leave you with an anecdote on this. So some of you may have heard of a Canadian physician, Gabor Mate, and he's written a bunch of books. And um, he's the, he's, I think around 80 years old now, somewhere around there. And he has done a lot of really, really intense clinical work. He has dealt with 
um, homeless population, substance use population, like people with really hard stories. Um, he also has a personal history of being a Holocaust survivor. So there's just a lot of heaviness. And in his most recent book, he talks about going down to Peru with some other people to do, you know, um, you know, one of those hallucinogenic like uh, healing ceremonies. And he gets down there to Peru and the, the shamans in Peru, the healers of the community, they took one look at him and they were like, you have too much negativity inside of you. And we're actually worried that if we bring you into this communal um, experience, that it's going to have a negative impact on other people. So they made him stay in a hut all by himself to do his whole like hallucinogenic journey because he, he just hadn't cleaned any of it out. And so it's really made me think about this concept of like spiritual hygiene or emotional hygiene and like, how do we, um, how do we deal with that increased sensitivity? How do we deal with the onslaught of humanity? And like, you know, what does that all mean? And for some people putting up a wall or numbness or barriers is actually adaptive because it keeps you safe. But I think that can certainly go to an extreme. And so you have to know how to come back to yourself. And, you know, this is something that we're constantly negotiating as healthcare providers. But I do think storytelling is a tool in the toolbox that we can use to, um, to keep up our health in that regard. Well, being mindful of time, we're at the top of the hour, and um, I really want to thank you, Dr. Silverman. It's been a really refreshing uh, presentation, and it's uh, provocative and, and raised a lot of interesting ideas. Um, I, there are some additional uh, questions in the Q&A that came in while you were sort of making closing remarks, and maybe maybe folks can try to reach you with those and, and take it offline. But, uh, you, you know, I really want to thank you today for taking the time to share your journey with us and, and how you've become a storyteller. And uh, it's, it's really been great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you so much for, again, everything that you all do. Your work is so important and I just have ongoing um, admiration and respect. So it's a pleasure to be here and uh, I wish you all a wonderful rest of your week and weekend.